Erev Tov Chavim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Very interesting message you got today. Uh, it does start off with a bit of a news broadcast on Planned Parenthood. I picked this up on several different news uh, medium, uh, media, media outlets there, the Wall Street Journal being one of them. Uh, the one that I actually am using, though, is not from the Wall Street Journal. I actually forget which one I, where I actually got this one out. But anyway, it came out today, October 13, 2015. It says, Planned Parenthood, uh, Parenthood to forego payment in fetal tissue program. Responding to a furor uh, over undercover videos, Planned Parenthood says it will maintain programs at some of its clinics that make fetal tissue available for research but will no longer accept any sort of payment to cover the cost of those programs. Well, that's a noble thing, isn't it? Anti-abortion activists who recently released a series of covertly filmed videos have contended that Planned Parenthood officials sought profits from their programs providing post-abortion fetal tissues to researchers. Planned Parenthood said the videos were deceptively edited and denied seeking any payments beyond legal permitted reimbursement of cost. That's the problem to begin with, is the fact that governments and laws have actually legalized abortion in the first place. Anyway, we'll go into all this here in just a moment here. The new policy foregoing even permissible reimbursement was outlined in a letter sent Thursday by Planned Parenthood's president, Cecil Richards, to Francis Collins, the director of the National Institute of Health. Planned Parenthood's policies on fetal tissue donation already exceeded the legal requirements, Richard wrote. Now we're going even further in order to take away any bias for attacking Planned Parenthood to advance an anti-abortion political agenda. Well, I have to tell you, it's not a political agenda. It is a murder, is what it is. It's not just the fact that you sell fetal parts. It's the mere fact that you're murder murdering innocent children that are in the mother's wombs. Now, I say this, and let me say this with delicacy for those precious women, the precious sisters out there, whether sisters or whether you're just a, a woman that might be watching this that has gone through some type of abortion in your life. Always remember, we serve a merciful God that does love you. And the only thing that he's looking for from you is a sincere repentance of heart. Repent to the child that lost its life as a result, only in the womb. He didn't lose it in the presence of God, for God has taken that child in his presence. Repent to God for this act, and he will certainly open his arms to you. It's not an unpardonable sin by no means. But what the serious side of this is, is that governments have legalized abortion and the murdering of millions of innocent babies. Just imagine, if it wasn't a legal process, there would be many more lives that are saved, no doubt. Now, I came up on this topic, though, and one of the reasons why I wanted to address it, of course, I get beat up from time to time by different comments. People saying, well, Steve, you are there for the animals, but you're not there for the children. Oh, yes, we are, and we have made that public before. We've also addressed many times in the past women that have gone through this very procedure, and we know for them it is very troubling, especially those that are believers now, because it is a burden and that they have carried all their lives. And so we, we try to also show compassion for them because sin is sin. It doesn't matter what it is. Not one person is greater than the other. But the legalizing of abortion, I believe, was actually done just as it was in the times of Moses when he was born. And the Pharaoh of Egypt was trying to find that anointed child of God. And so he slew all of the children, two years old and down, threw them in the river and fed them to the crocodiles. Even when Yeshua came on the earth, Satan was trying to find that anointed child and had Caesar Augustus murder all the children from three years old and down, trying to find that precious anointed child of God. And it was no different in the day we're living in now. History only repeats itself. But why would Satan want to take and have abortion legalized? Other than the fact he is the father of death, loves death, and wants to kill anything and everything. But the main reason it is, is because God did promise to send two witnesses in the latter day. Two men that will be anointed with the spirit of Moses and Elijah. And they will be here in this day be two men with that actual spirit. Not the literal Moses and Elijah from all the thousands of years ago, 
but it will be their spirits upon these two individuals. And Satan, knowing this and knowing the words of God, has sought also once again to try to find the timing of when this would be, what the age would be, that age that is to come that Jesus speaks about so many times in our canon as well as in the Essene uh, Bible places as well. And so Satan knew what to look for, for that age to come. And when that age was finally beginning to take shape, he legalized abortion not knowing really for sure when it would begin, but he was trying to find and kill those children that they may be born in. And of course, to him, it's just another sacrifice on his altar of evil, evil bloodshed. So anyway, it is a despicable thing nonetheless, and God will hold responsible those that legalized it and those that perform it, nurses, doctors, etc., except they repent. There will be a very slim chance of ever making it. But God is still merciful even in that case. All right, so let's go right into this message. It is not just a news message. This is really more of a biblical teaching tonight. And the Lord kind of laid on my heart to share with you regarding this, though, how what brings it to a place where a nation is willing to kill their own children? Well, biblically speaking, if you go back in the Bible... Even Israel, from a historical standpoint, offered their own children up as sacrifices on a demonic altar. We find this in the book of Psalms, chapter 106. But it wasn't just there that we find this. It's all been going on all along. And I find it interesting, though, because what made it easy for Israel to end up offering up human sacrifices? It was because they were offering animal sacrifices in the first place. Let's first take a look at a particular scripture here. I want to just share a few of these here with you, but let me uh, pull one up here for you. This is in Jeremiah uh, chapter 7. And let's, let's drop down to verse 22. He says, For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsel and the stubbornness of their own evil heart and went backward, not forward, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day I have sent you all my servants to prophets daily, rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but, but stiffened their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. Now we're going to actually, I've said this many times before, I Say it's in Micah, Hosea, and stuff. In this message tonight, we're going to break these things down. And the reason why I think this is important is because why do we get to a place where governments, people, have lost their humanity for the children that are in the womb and are willing to kill them? Abort the child, as they call it, Planned Parenthood. No, it's Satanhood is what it is. It's sacrificing a child to a demonic god exactly what it is. But it comes first when you're willing to have no mercy on animals as well. Now, many of you guys have written me, hundreds of you have written me wanting to know more about the humane gospel that Yeshua spoke about in what is called the Essene Humane Gospel of Jesus. There's other ones, the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Uh, scholars even recognize the Gospel of the Holy Twelve as being the most authenticated uh, book there is uh, for a in fact, it's actually where some scholars have stated that the Gospel of the Holy Twelve is where we get our original four Gospels, other than they claim that they have been altered, which I can see that as well. Uh, and, that, of course, that brings us to another point, and let me just, I, will, I do need to bring this out as well. Some people also write, and they've argued, they say, well, Steve, you're saying that God is not man enough to keep up his own word, that he didn't keep it, that what we have, the King James Version Bible, was not good enough. The King James Bible is a good Bible. I'm not against that. But has there been altered things? Sure there has. In fact, for the sisters, many of you, when we began to share with you how that the translated words in there were altered and changed 
to make you subservient to men when you found out that's not really what was written there, even from the Genesis all the way down to the book of Revelation there. You rejoice with great exceedingly gladness to know that God made you equal with a man, that you were not some kind of lesser being and God didn't care about you but loved you just as much. Well, even the humane gospel has those same things there, the equality of both men and women. In fact, so great is the equality that Jesus goes to in the humane gospel. Something before we ever heard about the humane gospel, we had already seen it ourselves where by the... Um, by the mistranslations of text and things and things that have been altered in the Bible. And sisters everywhere rejoiced to hear these things. Even brothers were shocked and rejoiced as well. But then again, there were those that said, no, you're adding to the word of God. No, we're just telling you what it really does say. But when it came to the meat, hundreds of you have changed. Hundreds. Brother, sister, listen to me. There's hundreds that have changed already. We've gotten the emails to prove it. Now, many of you have written and even said that, you know, it, it moved your heart within you. The Spirit of God moved within you. But then many of, or not a, a minority, I should say, have actually written and said to me, you're judging us, you're condemning us, I feel bad about this, or whatever the case may be. I do not judge you. What I'm trying to show you, and this is what you're going to learn tonight, is that there is a permissive will of God, not His perfect will. And many have written and said, well, you write, we find in the book of Leviticus, we find here and there that God permitted us to kill and eat the animals, etc. Well, I'm going to show you tonight three places where God clearly gives you a diet, actually four places, you're going to find out what it was in the Garden of Eden. You'll find out what it was in the time of Noah. You'll find out what it was in the time of the Exodus from Egypt, as well as you will find out what it is in the millennium. Every single time, it is a vegetarian diet. That's a shock to most people. They don't believe that, but it is true. And it's written in your own words. So the question is, is what's gone wrong? Where's the problem? Well, according to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, uh, he actually says what happens here. And interesting, interesting enough, Jesus has made the same statement. He says, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The King James says it's, the pen is in vain. The word vain and lie is totally two different words. And when you look in the Hebrew language right here, it is clearly the word for a lie. See, shakar. La shakar, that is, there's no other, you cannot change the word shakar into the word vanity. It is clearly a lie. So the scribes, it wasn't that God didn't do his word right. It's the scribes that altered it, just like they have done in modern days where they go and translate the Bible and they alter what the word really should mean. That's how we find out that women were, like, for example, the headship doctrine. Oh, there's, as my wife always says, there's no ship to the head. In the Koine Greek, kephale is a source, not authority. There's a completely different word for authority. In fact, when it says that you're over your children, that word is authority. But kephale is source. In other words, God is a source of Christ because he come from him. And Christ was the source of man or mankind when God had made Adam and Eve as one being there. And then Adam, the man, was the source of the woman. See, she come out of him, taken from his side, speaking of Eve. This is what this is actually speaking of. You rejoice for these things. Then bear with me when I try to show you God's perfect plan. Keep in mind this as well. Does God change his mind? You have to ask yourself that question. Does God change his mind? We have to think that God, if, if we look at this in, in thinking that, well, it's okay to eat meat, it's okay to do this and that, then we must conclude then that God doesn't keep his word. Because God is supposed to be an unchanging God. As it says in Hebrews 13, 8 about Jesus, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means he changes not. God is an unchanging God. If he's an unchanging God, then why did he change the dietary laws from Genesis to eating flesh and having a good old time eating meat when we get down into the biblical times of Moses and Abraham, etc. Or did somebody alter something? 
Well, let's look at it. I told you we need to look at this from a prophetic standpoint. All right. Now, as I've said many times in the past, or more recently, I should say, I've actually challenged people and I said, look, if you can't accept the seeing humane gospel as being a, a, a validated uh, biblical canon that was left out of the original canon, then consider it for the weight that it stands on prophetically. I have given many prophecies in here, you, or read them, not that I give them, that Jesus actually quotes in here. Keep in mind, we actually have original fragments of these books that have been found much older than anything for the four Gospels that we have in the Bible. In fact, there are no original fragments of the four Gospels. It's funny, we've got fragments of Paul's letters, but we don't have any fragments of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John clearly come from the Holy Twelve. But of course, Constantine, who was a meat eater, and also it is historically a fact that he poured molten lead down the throats of the Christians that were vegetarians that they didn't convert going back to eating meat. It's also written in the Talmud of all places that at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple, that many of the people had stopped eating meat and, strong, and drinking strong drink. They didn't drink wine. Why does the Talmud record such a thing when they were very much for the eating of meat? Well, even the church fathers, Tertullian, Clement, many of them, Plinius, all of these guys actually write how that the early churches, the church believers were vegetarians. They, they say that this is what Jesus actually taught. All right, now let's get back on track. I don't want to get you too lost here because we've got a lot of information to cover tonight. Uh, something very incredible. And uh, like I said, this is relating to Planned Parenthood, believe it or not, the killing of the unborn children. And I'm going to take you into that and so you understand why. But let's take, though, and look at this in light of the fact that people have written me and said, you seem to think that God can't keep his word. Yes, I do believe he can keep his word. The only thing is, is we're discovering it now many of the documents that have been hidden. In fact, at the time of Constantine, historically speaking, there were 200 books, 200 writings of the life of Jesus, the works that he did. Why did we only get four of them put in the Bible? In fact, they were burning anything and everything else that they could get their hands on so that nobody would know what was really written because they didn't want you knowing what was there. And in modern times, there have been more and more things been dug up. The Gospel of Philip is one of them, another authentic book with an actual fragment that lines up with the humane Gospel of Jesus as well as the Holy Twelve. They dovetail together. The, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene as well, another fascinating writing, clearly showing that women were equal as Jesus taught. Now, this is written in chapter 87. Those of you that have the humane Gospel that I've sent to you by email, if you want a copy, Write me. By the way, it's look a little bit funny. I put it in Bible format for you, chapters, verses, etc. And but I have been going through. I, I'm not. I'm not completed with it yet. I can resend it to all you guys later when I am completed. But I'm. I'm actually going in there and putting all the references to our own canon, where you'll find all the facts right there, so you can see it lines up with our own Bible. Anyway, chapter 87, verse 3, Jesus says here, But verily I tell you, the time cometh when spiritual darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, I think Paul actually speaks about that. Uh, now you know where, where he gets it from. And the enemies of truth and righteousness shall rule in my name as a mockery of truth. Are you kidding me? Jesus just said that the enemies of truth and righteousness shall rule in my name as a mockery of truth, and they shall set up a kingdom of this world and oppress many people. You know, that's not just the Catholic Church, although the Catholic Church is the main one because they claim to rule in the name of Jesus Christ. They claim to be the vicar of Christ, which is literally the word vicar, a Latin word means a substitute for Christ. Some people have written and said, you know, well, no, the popes are actually, uh, they take the place of Peter. Well, the, the Latin word vicar of Christ is a substitute. It is one that takes the place of Christ, not the place of Peter. They just believe that Peter took the place of Christ as well. They consider him to be the vicar of Christ. So Jesus says that there are going to be those that will rule in his name. And he says, gross darkness shall cover. This is in our own canon, friends. 
And yet the thing is, is because we don't get all the words that Jesus spoke about it, you know, much of this got left out, you know. So, uh, so therefore, we're unable to know really what this really meant. Uh, actually, uh, I said that that was uh, written by Paul. It's not. It's actually written by Isaiah chapter 60. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen um, upon thee. So also Jeremiah speaks about it as well, but Isaiah 60 verse 2, uh, again, another reference there. Now Jesus is telling you though that this is something that still has not been fulfilled. Isaiah was prophesying of this, and when we get to see what Jesus says in the humane gospel, he's still putting it in the future that gross darkness shall cover the earth, and it's going to be sub people that will rule in his name. So it's going to be Christianity of today that makes a mockery of the word. Mainly, we're looking at Catholicism, but all those churches that have joined in or carry the same type doctrines as the Catholic Church does are doing the exact same thing. Let's see what he says. Verse 4, And thus shall they cause the enemy to blaspheme truth by replacing my doctrines with the opinions of evil men. Now he's actually prophesying that they're going to change his doctrines. Now, like I said, if you look at this from a prophetic standpoint, this document, if you just look at it for prophecy's sake, with and it being an actual fragment that is found that was actually a completed scroll, it wasn't so preserved so well, it's a completed scroll, yet it's, it's so perfectly true because the words that are written here have all been changed just as he prophesied that it would be, and he claims that it would be those that would rule in his name that would do it, and we can historically see, we know for a fact from the writings of the early church fathers that they were in, uh, uh, the, the early church fathers, many of them spoke against what the Catholic Church was doing, changing the very words that were written by the original apostles. In fact, the very man that was originally writing this for the first pope writes to the pope. I forget his name. I, I, I wish I'd have had it for this message here. He writes to him. He's convicted in his heart because he says, I'm having to change things to go along with what they wanted him to write in there. Altering the word of God is actually historical documentation. In fact, I've said many times before that if you look at the, it's in, it's in uh, the British Museum, the oldest manuscript, not a, not a fragment, but the oldest manuscript they have of the Bible, there's 1,400 differences to the translation we have today. So the God that changes not, why do we keep changing the Bible? All right, so anyway, Jesus says here, doctrines with the opinions of evil men, yea, thus shall they teach in my name that which I have not taught, and they shall darken much truth that I have taught by their worthless traditions and lies. Many shall say, look ye here and look ye over there, but truth shall not be found in them. But sadden not, take courage, for the appointed time will I also come when the truth they have hidden and suppressed shall be manifest, and the light shall shine and the darkness shall pass away, and the true kingdom of righteousness shall be established in the world, and all the false prophets shall be exposed and put to shame. So see, when you ask, is God able to preserve his word? Yes. This is why the apostles were burying the true documents. St. James, all of them, they went into Egypt and buried documents. They went into India and buried documents. You know, there was one brother that wrote me. It was really interesting. He said when he began to read the Humane Gospel, the first 12 pages there, he said it really troubled him at first. He said, because I was reading it, my brother, he says, and I saw that Jesus goes into India and Persia and was teaching. He said, I'm thinking to myself, I never saw that in the Bible. He said the next morning he gets up, and when he does, he opens up his Bible. He begins to, to read in the words of Paul, and I forget exactly where it's at, but he said that God, it actually was written by Paul, that he, uh, I think it's Paul, that he preached both far and near. And he, he was just excited to read that because he said it only confirmed that what he was reading was actually true. You know, so these are the wonderful blessings, friends, that you, you know, even myself, the same thing that we have found as well is that when you really begin to look 
look at this from a, from, a, from a scholastic standpoint, researching, confirming, and finding things, you find that it is a very accurate document, clearly, to say the least. Now, we will be doing a video in the near future on the authenticity of the Essene Humane Gospel as well. Uh, I, I do have a friend uh, that's, uh, that is a scholar that has worked with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I'll be bringing him on uh, in, a, in, a, in an interview to discuss some of these uh, facts as well. Anyway, finishing this up, verse 6, for their own ignorance and deceptive measures shall they be self-exposed as liars and frauds, speaking untruths in my name in which I spake not unto you. So yes, God did preserve his word. They just had to hide it. And he did have it to where, of course, the gross darkness would cover the land. It's prophesied in Isaiah. Read it to you a moment ago. I believe that. I believe Paul does reference that as well, but it's in another place there. Now, one other thing I wanted to share with you, though, because some people would say, well, what happened to all the Christians down through the years and that, have, that, that didn't know these things? What happened to them? Hmm. You know, it's kind of funny. It's like putting the shoe on, the, having to step in someone else's shoes. It's just kind of like when, when the Christians try to say about the Jewish people that all the Jews are going to hell because they did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And yet you have in your own canon that he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But you can't accept that. You can't accept the fact that he actually pardoned them and asked God to forgive them. You just have to say that, well, unless they accept Jesus Christ and confess him as their personal Savior, they're all lost and going to hell. But now you run into a situation that for hundreds and hundreds of years, nearly 2,000 years, the Catholic Church who originally perverted the word of God that was written. And historically, like I said, historically, you can look at this and find out historically from some of the writings of the early church fathers of the perversions and the, the distorting of the word of God. And yet, <laughs> oh gosh, I, my mind's going in a hundred different directions. All right, let, let, let me get back on track here. So we find out that God does though, have mercy, just like he did with the Jews. He has mercy on the Gentiles that also, all of our forefathers that were Christians in these different churches that did believe that it was okay to kill animals and eat them. Again, it is a permissive will of God. So don't get me wrong. God, he did allow this to happen. And we're going to go into that in a few minutes. So does God not have mercy because the people don't know? Sure. We find this in Proverbs 24, 12. He says, If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doeth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doeth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? You see, so God is merciful. He does know, just like myself, I was a hunter, killed, ate everything my entire life. But the moment I heard these things in my own soul, something rang out and rang true. And even Jesus teaches in the humane gospel when his apostles come to him and ask him, you know, Lord, what do we do? You know, with those that have not stopped eating meat, he said, let them stay in the outer court. He said, but be patient with them. You have to remember, friends, in the millennium, the Bible says there'll be no death. There'll be no killing in the millennium, just like it was when Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden. There was no death. But Satan is the author of death. And death has ruled even till now because of it. All right? Now, if you look, though, as I said, what brings, if Planned Parenthood, if the, the legalizing of abortion, Roe versus Wade, if all of this has come to pass and the people all over the world now actually are able, now I don't think it's in every country, but abortion is legalized in many, many places in the world. And how then can people be so cruel to be able to kill unborn babies. Like I said, it starts when you're willing to kill animals. It makes it easier. It's just like war. Some of the best soldiers are those that are hunters because they've learned the hardness of being able to kill and harden their hearts, block it out. And I know what it's like because killing those animals always troubled my heart. If you look in the book of Judges in the 11th chapter, we find out that Jephthah and 
he was the one that passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and he passed over Mizpah of Gilead from Mizpah and Gilead. He passed over unto the children of Ammon. He actually asked the Lord. He makes a vow to the Lord, and he says, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, I will, when I return home, I'll just paraphrase, when I return home, I will, the first thing that I see, I will offer as an offering unto you. When he goes back home, we find in the 34th verse, he came to Mizpah and into his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. He vowed to offer to God as a sacrifice, whatever came to him first. He was kind of hoping, I guess, it was going to be a goat or a dog, or, or you know, whatever the case was. He wasn't expecting that his daughter would run out. Do you really think that God was interested in his daughter to be a sacrifice? Especially in light, we just read to you a little bit ago here, Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah says that God never commanded your fathers to offer sacrifices when they come into the wilderness, when they came out of the Egypt into the wilderness journey. And if you look and you go to Deuteronomy, we find out when Moses goes up on the mountain and he gets the Ten Commandments and he comes back down, of course, he breaks those commandments because of the, Israel has already made a golden calf and everything. But what does he do? He gives the Ten Commandments and two statutes and Deuteronomy declares and, he, and God added no more. So why 613 laws then out of Leviticus? This was because of the sins of Israel. Not that God was interested in giving Israel all these covenant laws and things of that nature. It was because of their own sins. You're going to find this out in a minute because we're going to get into this. Psalm 106. Let me, let me just quote to you here. Uh, this is um, found in verse 34. God says here, they did not destroy through David, through the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols, and, and which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Why were they willing to sacrifice their own children? Because they had already been offering animal sacrifices. And many of you are probably saying right now, well, it's a Levitical law. You know, where do you do that? What about the, what about the lamb and, uh, you know, when, when Moses come out of the, you know, he commanded them to kill the lamb? I don't have the answers to all of this as of yet, but I, what I do know, I'm going to share with you. As I said to you, Jeremiah says, no, that's not true. God never commanded you to offer the sacrifices. Let's just read it again because I want to make sure this really comes home really good for you so that it helps you to understand. And you'll get it better even when we go through the Psalm 106. We're actually going to go through the entire chapter. All right? So he says here, verse 22, For I did not speak unto your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I commanded you, that it may be well with you. Now, do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 12, I believe it is? Verse 17. And, and by the way, this is also in the Humane Gospel as well. Like I said, it's actually taken from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, actually the same Gospel of the Holy Twelve there. Uh, Matthew 12, I believe it's 17. Let me just look at it real quick here to see. Um, no, I'm sorry, verse 7, not 17. Let's start with verse 6. But I say unto you that this, is, this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Now, even if I don't take you into the Hebrew Matthew, there is a Hebrew Matthew that's actually older document than what we have uh, as far as in the Matthew of our own canon from the Masoretic text. All right, but in this one here, he says, you, m many people apply this to Jesus. They believe that Jesus was the one that was condemned, but it's in the past tense. You would not have condemned. They, in other words, they've already condemned the innocent. 
See, and Jesus says, if you knew, look at it again. He said, if you had known what this meaneth or what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. God didn't want to sacrifice just like Jeremiah commanded here. He didn't want to sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Past tense. Do you know in the Hebrew, Matthew, when they document this here, he says, you would not have bound the innocent. And it's in the masculine plural showing that it's the animal sacrifices. Jesus, when he goes in the temple, he beats the money changers, according to the book of John, and he looses the animals and sets them free. And said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. Wow. So something's wrong there, isn't it? All right. So now, all right, just, I'm just trying to get you to establish something here for you, a background so you can understand exactly where we're going with this. Now, let's take, and I want to take you to Psalm 106. We're going to start here with uh, verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou uh, bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation. All right that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may, may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with their inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Listen to this very carefully. I'm going to break it down as we go. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Okay? He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths and through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy, the Egyptians. And the waters covered their enemies, and there was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, they sang his praises. We find that in Exodus chapter 15. They ran up and down the, the, the beach here. Of course, Exodus 15 is also a future event. Moses says, I shall sing unto the Lord that he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. One horse, one rider, not 600. Prophetic. Verse 13 they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. That's the dangerous thing. You see, God was going to give Moses the Ten Commandments at Mount Horeb. But he had not given it as of yet, and God already says they did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. What did they lust for in the wilderness? It was the blood. You remember what it says there when, when they were coming along and they were angry with Moses, they were thirsting, and they said, we remember the melons, we remember the garlic, we remember all this, we remember the, we remember the fish back we had back in Egypt that we could eat to the full, whatever we wanted. And then God was so angry with the children of Israel that he come down. And then he permitted them to have quail. Notice that. He permitted them to have quail. It was not his original intention. He permits it. Because when God speaks about the land flowing with milk and honey, he never says that it's going to be calves or anything like that. And speaking of that, is they're coming through with all their flocks and they're starving to death, why didn't they just go ahead and kill and eat the flocks? You ever wonder about that? Why were they starving to death when they had cattle? Undoubtedly, they weren't permitted to eat that cattle, were they? And they were thirsting to death. And they said they remember everything. They remember the fish. Now, God never was angry with them over the melons or over the garlic. He doesn't mention any of that. But he actually says, because of the blood, the fish. And God's anger kindled against them. And he tells Moses, just paraphrasing all this, you know the story. But he tells Moses, I will give them quail. He permits it. Not his perfect will, but he permits it. 
And he brings in a wind and brings in quail, so many that they, they're gathering it, and they're all excited gathering all these quail, so many omers for each family and stuff like that. And the Bible records that while the meat was yet between their teeth, okay? Let me pull that up for you just so you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, while it was between their teeth, all right, let's see here. It's actually in several places here. Let's just look at numbers here. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He hath gathered least, gathered ten omers, and they that spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place uh, Kibroth uh, Hata'ava because there they buried the people that lusted and the people journeyed from there. Oh, the name of that place there, Hezroth, in a boat in Hezroth. What was their lust? Their lust was over the flesh. What, what did he just say here? What did I just read to you? But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Their lust was for flesh. And he gave them, David says here, and he gave them their request, but sent leanness unto their soul. That's what I mean. It is a permissive will. But he also said it was leanness unto the soul. Now, I want to, this is something you're going to find interesting. If you go to the Essene Gospel, we find out something about that leanness of the soul. And this can be found in chapter 26. And uh, let me just pull this up here. And starting with verse 6, where he says, For I say, this is Jesus, For I say unto you, though you be gathered together in my bosom, if you keep not all my commandments, I will cast you forth. For if you keep not the lesser revelations, who I ask shall give you the greater ones. For since, the time, since time immoral, God has at no time required animal or human sacrifices lest he be inferior to the holy law. Nor has God permitted man or beast to devour one another for food. It wasn't like that in the beginning. Beasts did it because of the fall. And where did they get it from? They learned it from man. All right? See? So he says here, uh, lest he be ignorant of his own love. How then do you eat flesh and give sacrifices of blood according to the law of humane love? You can't do it. If it's true love, true love loves his neighbor. He loves the animals that God created. If God created the animals in the beginning in the Garden of Eden and he blessed them and said multiply and replenish the earth, he didn't say anything about eating them. Now, some people argue, they say, well, you know, God said to Noah in Genesis that we're allowed to eat the animals. No, he didn't. You let the rabbis pervert what it says to you, but that's not what he says. I'll take you right what he said. Let me finish this first, then we'll go back to what, what God says to Noah. He says, you know not the true God, but worship the perverted God of thy, of thy world. Even Satan, the one of the same father of the sword and bloodshed, for by this one, death entered into the world, and death spread to all things, for all things are in bondage and slaves to the master of the lie. But I come to set free those imprisoned by chains of sin and give, give forth my holy law again unto the nations that they may know the only true God of love and mercy. For my God above suffereth sin and error of men much, lest he put a swift end to the vanity of the world and cut off his elect seed. See what he said there? God above suffereth sin and error of men much. He's permitted it. He's suffered with us. But Jesus also says that he will send forth his messengers in the last day and they will restore his holy law to bring us back to God's perfect will. Be patient. Pray about it. And by the way, if you get in, uh, you know, one person was writing me, they, they, they were trying to do a vegetarian thing. This has happened before they ever heard about things that I teach about it, but they did it years ago, and 
they ended up, the doctor told them they had to stop because they'd gotten so malnutrition. There is a right way to eat, friends. But no, you don't become malnutritioned if you do it the right way. You've got to research. Send my wife an email. She'll help you. She knows it very well. But you can be vegetarian, vegan. If you want to be a vegan, it's okay. God didn't say you had to be a vegan, but it's up to you which way you want to do. But there is more protein, more of the vitamins. Everything you need is in these plants. Do you think the cow has to eat meat in order to get all the nutrients that he needs? He grows very well, very well just eating grass, doesn't he? So think about it. All right, anyway, it goes on. Be you faithful to the, to the complete law of God, lest you stumble in your evil ways and meet death as thy final reward. For he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So it is with the holy law. For the first truths you keepeth not, but seek after the greater. See? If you can't keep the, 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 the smaller ones, you definitely, why are you seeking after the greater? Seek ye first the laws of God and, else will, and all else will be revealed unto you. No man may digest the solid food of God, lest first he taketh of the, the liquid. For my law is the water of life. Drink ye like pure water, and all other mysteries of God will be open to you. And then you will know the true God and his, and his, and his good works." Now, I brought this out because why? What did he say right here in verse 15? And he gave them their request. In other words, he allowed them to eat the meat, but sent leanness unto their soul. They didn't get the greater revelations because of it. Now, here's an interesting note for you as well. The early church fathers, all right? Early church fathers also spoke about the same thing. Let me give you some of the ones here, just to kind of give you an idea. Tortullian, he says, was one of the early church fathers who wrote extensively on the subject of vegetarianism. According to Tertullian, flesh eating is not conducive to the highest life. It violates moral law and debases man in intellect and emotion. Makes you leanness, doesn't it? Makes your soul lean. He argued, and even if he handed over you the keys of the slaughterhouse and permitting you to eat all things, at least he has not made the kingdom of heaven to consist of in butchery. For he says, he eating and drinking is not in the kingdom of God. Interesting, isn't it? Tertullian, early church father, he was, he's back from, uh, what is it, 155 to 160, he was born right in there. He's born right there during the times, uh, 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 right after the lives of the apostles. He also wrote here, he says, How unworthy to do you press the example of Christ as, as having come eating and drinking into the service of your lust. He who pronounced not the full, but the hungry and thirsty blessed, who professed his work to be the completion of his Father's will, was not wont to abstain, instructing them to labor for that meat which is last to eternal life, and enjoying in their common prayers petition, not for gross food, but for bread only. Interesting, isn't it? And only him, Clement, what did Clement actually write? Clement wrote here that a life of virtue is one of simplicity, and that the Apostle Matthew was a vegetarian, according to Clement, eating flesh and drinking wine is rather characteristic to a beast, and the fumes rising from them being dense. Darken the soul. Destroy not the works of God for the sake of food. Whether you eat or drink, do all in the glory of God, aiming after true frugality, for it is lawful for me to partake of all things. See, that's what I've told you before. There is a permissive will of God. It is lawful. You can do it if you so desire. All right? But what does he say here? Yet all things are not expedient. Neither is there regimen for a Christian formed by indulgence. Man is not by nature a gravy eater, but a bread eater. Interesting. Verse 16 in the book of Psalms, going back to 106th Psalm here. They envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Ebram. 
and a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf of Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wonders, works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them? Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. They despised the pleasant land. You know what the pleasant land is? Let me, let me share it with you what the pleasant land really is. You find this in the book of Deuteronomy. This is where God speaks about the pleasant land, the promised land where he's going to send them. And it's actually, if you have a King James Bible, that's the very scripture it references. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is where it references it for you there, that pleasant land. Notice what it says, Yea, they despise the pleasant land, they believe not his word. What does God mean when he says they believe not his word? What he said that they were going to have, and also the commandments. Thou shalt not kill. That word in Hebrew is also butcher, to slaughter. You're not to slaughter. What does it say here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6? Therefore thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees, and a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, and a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest be, dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good of the land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and judgments and his statutes which I have commanded you this day. Wait a minute. I thought you said God said it's okay, you, you, you can kill and eat all the animals you want. That was a permissive will. Remember, let's back up again. Remember what he said. He permitted them I think it's verse 14, 15. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert, and he gave them their request. That was the quails. See, they didn't believe God. That's what it says in verse 24. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. What did they despise? We saw that in the wilderness journey, they, were, they loathed over the fact that they weren't getting meat to eat. All they got was the manna. They said, all we got is this manna, 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 manna. And God promises them in, in Deuteronomy here, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. All these things here, the waters, the brooks, everything. And they despised that and wanted the blood instead. Now, David says he, he allowed it. He permitted it. See, verse 15, and he gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul. He wouldn't give them any greater revelation as a result. Not only that, it gets worse. Another one you'll see. Go back up here to verse 24. Yea, they despised the pleasant land, they believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nation and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Again, Deuteronomy doesn't mention anything about eating the flesh. It's a permissive will. All right, let me take you real quick. Genesis chapter 9. And this is where, because people say, well, no, God commanded with, with, with um, he commanded with uh, Noah that they could do it. All right, Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Not the word meat. That's King James, the way they wrote it. That's the way they translated it. Remember like the women, you know, where we tell you sisters, you know, that head doesn't mean authority or boss. The word meat here is translated meat, and you think of flesh like, you know, your steak sandwich or something from a cow. But in Hebrew, it's ochel, food. 
Just like those that write and say about Timothy 4.1, you know, that teach them to abstain from meat. Well, it doesn't say the word meat in Greek either. It says food. And it says that uh, uh, the sacrifices... Or, or wait a minute, let me, let me take you real quick to 1 Timothy because so many people send that verse to me and quote that verse and totally, totally mess it up. You know, and, and there again, people mean well. They just don't realize that they, they don't even know the true tr translation of it. All right? 1 Timothy 4.3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. The word in Greek is food, not meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God, the word creature there in Greek is not creature either, it's every created thing. What is Paul really talking about? So it's actually flip-flop. You're thinking that those that say, you know, abstain from eating flesh, and those that, are, that say we can't eat all the creatures of God, that they're the ones that have the doctrines of devils. It's the other way around. Because he actually says here, forbidding to marry and, con and commanding to abstain from food which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and knoweth not the truth. For every created thing of God is good and nothing to be refused. Not every creature, every created thing. What did God create? The fruits of the field. So here again, people are just... Don't, they don't know the right translation of the Word of God. And unfortunately, this is what gets the people in the, in the predicament that we get into like this here. So anyway, so in Genesis, when God is dealing with, with Noah, He says, uh, Liveth shall be meat for you, or food for you, because in Hebrew it's a even as the green herb have I given you all things. All right? He's actually given him the reference, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye or you not eat. So when he says he's giving you all things, he's making sure that you know if it's an animal that has blood in it, you don't eat it. Do you think God put all the animals on the ark to save their lives there just to become the, all the steak dinners for, for Noah? No, he told him, don't eat it. I mean, think of the logic behind it. Do you realize that certain animals would have been extinct? In fact, most of them would have been because there wasn't enough time to repopulate the earth with animals if Noah went and his sons went to killing and eating everything that they had. Because on some of them, there were only two. Some of them, there were seven because the clean and unclean, as it was so called, called. And by the way, Jesus and the humane gospel said they're all clean. Gosh. Now, let me show you another proof of this. When you drop down to verse 9 in Genesis, and I beheld and I established my, and behold, I established my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. So God was making the same covenant with Noah and the animals. They were not to kill and eat each other. God was setting up like it was in the Garden of Eden. You know, friends, I mean, everything's been so twisted up, it's not even funny. Let's go back and let's pick up now, back where we left off here in, in the book of Psalms 106. Verse 26, Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations. They joined themselves also into Bel Peor and the sacrifices of the dead. See? And ate the sacrifices of the dead. Bel Peor this, where do you think they got the idea of offering sacrifices to begin with? It wasn't God's original will. According to Jeremiah, he said, I never commanded your fathers to do it. Even Paul, I believe it's Paul. Let me see if I can find that one for you as well real quick. Um, no, it's not. Yes, it actually it, it is Paul. In Acts 7.42, the then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Molech and the 
uh, of your God, Rempham, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Wait a minute. I mean, something's wrong here. Paul recognizes 40 years they offered sacrifices to who? To Molech in the wilderness. Jeremiah says that God never commanded your fathers to offer sacrifices. Read it again. Chapter 7, verse 23. I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in the way which I command you, that it be may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsel, in the stubbornness of their own evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Paul says right here, what did you do? You went after Molech and you began to offer sacrifices for the space of 40 years. If they were doing it from the space of 40 years, it wasn't because God gave Moses a commandment to go kill in all these animals. So yes, there's a problem. There's a big problem. All right? Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and he had appointed speaking unto Moses that should make it according to the fashion of that he had seen. But what did they do? They went out and offered sacrifices instead. It, start, it starts to make more sense when you begin to really look at the word. All right? Thus they provoked him. This is back in Psalm chapter 106, verse 29. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and they plague, plague break in upon them. See, the plague broke upon them. Remember, even the, you can look at the one of the plagues, many plagues that hit them, but one of the plagues that they got when they wanted the quail, God caused them to have a plague, and they, the, he, said, he said that they would eat it till it comes out their nose, out their mouth, out their ears, and the Bible says that a plague struck them and a thousand of them died at one time. You're going to find sin here too. Then stood up Phinephas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. And that, that was counted unto him for righteousness until all the generations forevermore. They, they angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. Because they provoked his spirit, so that he spoke unadvisedly with his lips. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but, there, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols which were snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. They were already sacrificing animals unto Molech. You see, friends, this is the whole thing even with Planned Parenthood. This is the problem. This is why they're willing to kill children in the mother's womb, because to them it's just flesh. You know, at one time I'd go in a supermarket, you see all the different packages of meat, you think nothing of it. Now it turns my stomach. Because I realize these are really your brothers and sisters. They're, they're lesser beings than we are, yes, but they still breathe the same breath of life that you have. They have a soul, according to Genesis you don't translate it, you put it living creature in King James, but it actually says that they have a nefesh chai, which is a living soul. And does not the word of God say, let me pull this up as well. Yes, Psalm 150 verse 6, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you not realize that these animals praise God with their own breath in their own way? Even the, even the church fathers wrote about that. I believe it was Clement that actually writes about that, that the animals worship the Lord. Jesus in the humane gospel speak of it, speaks about it as well. Are we to take and kill these animals? I mean, one, we break the commandment of God that says, Thou shalt not kill. We break another commandment of God that says, Thou shalt not covet. When that mother cow, for example, in a, in a farm, that they're using her as a milking cow, if she is willing to give you of her milk to share with you, it would be, it's okay. But when you take and rob that mother and steal that baby from that mother because it's a male 
calf and not good for much of anything. And then you take and he doesn't get his own mother's milk, but he gets some kind of corn grain mixed with blood and everything else with it. And then they take and they, they intentionally keep him from iron in order to make his meat look more white and go out and slaughter him for veal. And by the way, Pope Francis and everybody says, oh, he's a vegetarian. No, he's not. Do you know they, they, they listed in the newspaper what he had when he was in the United States? Lobster was one of his dishes. And then the next day, his next dish was veal. A slaughtered baby calf. Oh, he's so humane, isn't he? No, he's not. Once you begin to kill animals, it's easy to take the human life. That's what happened to Israel. Once they had offered all these animal sacrifices unto Molech, their God, according to Paul, for the space of 40 years, you know, if they were offering for the space of 40 years, they were only in the wilderness for 40 years, friends. 40 years they were in that wilderness journey. So if they were offering it to Molech for the whole time, it wasn't because they started off doing it the way God wanted it and then later they changed. No, they were offering it to Molech the entire time. And finally they started offering up their children. That's what happened. When Yeshua come and he reestablished the humane law, and historically by the church fathers we see that it was the humane law was restored there as well. Look at the history of it. Look at the historical facts that said that Constantine poured molten lead down the throats of Christians that were vegetarians if they didn't convert. You don't think they weren't trying to shut up what Jesus had to say? Sure they were. That's something for you to think about, isn't it? And what did they do? Jesus said, I read to you the prophecy, gross darkness would cover the earth and they would rule in his name. So they just took Constantine, mixed it up with Mithras religion there, and they got him a whole new doctrine out there, and they started this whole new campaign. of. But they went right back to slaughtering meat. So see, the sacrifices are still being offered. And by the way, your body is the temple of, of God. Jesus says, don't put dead things in your temple. Even in the King James, it's actually written. He says, Paul, and Paul gets it from Jesus it's in the humane gospel, where he says, those that destroy the temple, him will God destroy. But Jesus goes further because he takes it from Jesus out of the humane gospel. Jesus says that when you put the dead things in your temple, you're defiling the temple of God. He says that, the, that your body is a temple of God and it's made for the living, not the dead. And where, where, when Jesus came and he cast the devils out of the man that was dwelling in the cemetery, so you know when he's in the cemetery, that's where the devils are. You know, now, well, let me, let me make one thing clear. God does not send people to hell because they eat meat. I will, I'll tell you that straight up. I'm not saying that you're going to go to hell for that. It's a permissive will. God will forgive for these things. But if we know God's perfect will, shouldn't we want, don't we want to try to strive in it? Do you not realize this is the type of messages your two witnesses are going to bring? They're not going to play church with you. They're not going to sit there and pat you on the back and say, oh, praise the God, you Baptists, you all had it right and everything. Jesus said that they'll have to restore the holy law anew. And even in your own Bible, our canon that we have right now, the King James, like I have right here, King James Bible here, what does he say there? That Elias, when they ask him, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come? John's dead now. Jesus says, Truly he shall first shall, he shall come and restore all things. I thought Jesus restored all things. Well, he did at that time, but according, and this is how it lines up perfectly with the humane gospel, because Jesus says what? They will, gross darkness will come, gross darkness will cover the land, and, the, and those that will rule in my name, they will change his words, change his teachings. Okay? So it does line up. So they perverted Jesus' words, so he's got to send Elijah to straighten it all out again. Wow. Okay, we're getting close. I, I know it's been long, friends, but I'm, I'm hoping it'll help you. Verse 30, then stood up Phineas. Okay, we got that there already. Verse 32, they angered him also in the waters of strife. We read that. Because of thy provoked his spirit so that they spake unadvisable of his lips. They did destroy the na nations. Okay, we read all that. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. We got further down than I thought. Let's go to verse 38. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they 
defiled with their own works, and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against this people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance, and he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them, and their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into the subjection under the hand. Uh, uh, many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low, for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard the, their cry. You see, God, even though they did all these wicked things, even killing their own children, he still, he still, what did he say here? He regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. That's why I say, my sisters that have gone through abortions, he still is a forgiving God. He still will hear you. See, he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from among the heathen. Give thanks unto thy holy name and triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from the everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord. You know, David said in the 51st Psalm, he didn't, that God desires not, you know, and the, oh gosh, let me read this real quick. Somebody said to me the other day, read on down, he said, then he says, offer up a sacrifice. Well, you know, then that shows a contradiction, doesn't it? You know, you found out here David was against it. You, 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 you got, you know, if he's against it, he's against it, plain and simple. That's all there is to it. He's against it. Uh, Isaiah 51. Um, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hinder, hinder part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Um, wait a minute. Okay, here we go. Yes, right here. Restore unto me the joy of salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guilt, guilt, guiltiness. O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desire, delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. See? Now, they read on down, they say in, in verse 19, it says, you know, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. <laughs> he just says right there that he desired not sacrifices, else would he have given it. So somebody went in there and added verse 19, which just makes it totally contrary to what he just said, a contradiction. So which one is true? All right. Now, let me let me in, in, in closing. Let me just share with you some some more uh, proofs here for you from the, from the Bible here. In Isaiah, what did Isaiah say? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice unto me? Saith the Lord, I am full of burnt offerings of rams and fat of beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bulls, bullocks, or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? See, just like, just like Jeremiah said, God didn't command this to your fathers. David says the same. What does it say in Jeremiah? Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Which one is that? Thou shalt not kill. To what purpose cometh there to me the incense of Sheba, and what sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay a stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them, and the neighbor and his friend shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised on the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Why does he send someone that has no mercy? Because Israel was not having mercy on the animals. This is why. Wow. Again, like I said, Jeremiah chapter 7. For I spake unto your fathers, nor, for I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them unto the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. That seems to be contrary to what everybody has thought. Oh my gosh. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and polluted with blood. Why is it polluted with blood? Because he doesn't want sacrifices. And as troops and robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent. Again, permissive will. It's not God's perfect will. But he's allowed you to do it. So the company of priests murder in the way by consent. For they commit lewdness. That's why I say, if the sacrifice of bulls and goats took away sins, remitted sins, then the temple should have never been destroyed. Because if that were the case, Israel should have been totally guiltless when Jesus came. But were they guiltless? No. Jesus had to what? Loose the animals? Set them free? He said, you make my father's house? They say, den of thieves. You know what it actually says? You make my father's house a house of slaughter. That's what it really says. Micah chapter 6, verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He hath showed the old man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Again, where's the slaying of the animal? Jesus says in the humane gospel that the slaying of the animal only adds condemnation. Let me, there's something, though, you may not have ever seen here in verse 9 of Micah chapter 6. It's a prophecy of the coming of Christ. He said, the Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod. And who he hath appointed? The rod is Christ. And what is the rod going to do? He's going to speak exactly what Micah says here. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod. He is the rod of iron. He is the rod of correction. And he came and he spoke the exact same thing in the humane gospel. We don't get it in our own gospel because they took it out. They said that Jesus was cooking fish and eating fish and that Jesus was killing and eating lambs and everything else because why? They perverted the words that he actually said and changed them and gross darkness has covered the land for nearly 2,000 or 1,700 years now. But there shall be light in the evening time. That's even another prophecy. Notice what it says here uh, uh, in... Um, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. That's how you know who the rod is. Christ is the rod. And that rod, notice what Micah says. What is it? Micah's telling you what the rod's going to say. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? The humane gospel is nothing but that. You drop down to verse 12 in Micah 6, for the rich men thereof are full of violence. 
And the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also I will make thee sick, and smiting thee, and making thee desolate because of thy sins. Make you sick, like he did with the children of Israel in the wilderness there when they got struck by the plague. Do you know that most of the diseases in people today are caused by meat? Cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart disease, all these things are caused by people that eat meat. Thou shalt eat but not be satisfied. And thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee. Let me tell you what that actually says in the Hebraic language. It doesn't say, thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee. It, it, it kind of still means the same thing, but actually what it should be translated as, thy sickness shall be in thy inward parts. Because of what? Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. You ever notice meat eaters, by the way, you may not know this unless you've ever become a vegetarian. Vegetarians are not hungry all the time. Meat eaters are. Because why? It's gluttony. You can never get enough. Constantly. Eat, 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 eat. He goes on to say, And thou shalt take hold, but thou shalt not deliver. And thou which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. So what didn't, what, what, what didn't kill them from sickness, they would go into captivity and be killed by the sword. It's exactly what happened to Israel. Exactly what happened. Anyway, friends, I trust this is a blessing to you somehow. It's not easy. Believe me, it's not easy for me to bring this type of message to you because so many people don't like to hear this. And I love you. Honestly, I really do love you. If you choose to eat meat, it is, God does, He does allow it. It's not His perfect will. That's the only thing I'm trying to show you is God's perfect will. And I've tried to demonstrate that by the very canon that we have today. It's there everywhere, if you only look. And I could go on for hours and share with you many more passages. This is only just a, just a small fragment of what's in our own canon. Pray about it sincerely. Don't just toss it aside. Pray about it. Seek God. I'm Stephen Benoon with Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. Remember, when they're willing to kill animals, they'll kill children as well. Imagine, you know, think about it. even some of the stories we read about. Uh, there's one airplane crash down in South America. They did a movie on it years ago. And what did the people do in order to keep them starving to death? They ate the people. They did cannibalism. You know, a, a sister put a very good state a comment on one of the videos the other day that somebody that was a, didn't like the fact that I was speaking about you know, the, the animals, and they said, you know, well, God's delivered all the animals into our hand. Yes, He delivered them into your hands to see what you'd do with them. Does the Bible not say that God, that a sparrow can't fall to the ground, that God doesn't know about it? What do you think He thinks about with the slaughter of the animals that are supposed to be worshiping Him, that have breath to worship Him, according to David in the Psalms? There's nothing humane about slaughter. There is no humane way to slaughter an animal. It's sickening what they're doing to our brothers and sisters of the household of God. But this sister put a very interesting comment up. She said, those of you that say that God has delivered them into your hands, he said, God has also delivered your children into your hands. Will you eat them as well? I thought, that's a pretty good point. That's what happened to Israel, though. They began to do that as well. And what do you think? Now, think about this. Is it any different today than it was with the children of Israel? It's only more subtle. Now we find out today that food products, even shampoos, even some sodas, actually have fetal cells in them. They figured they can get you to kill and eat the meat. Why not go ahead and have you eat the children as well that were aborted? So yes, Planned Parenthood, they, yeah, they still sell the fetal cells and tissues and everything else. And I've been told by numerous people, and I've looked it up for myself, that yes, fetal cells are used in foods, and they're, they're, it's used in vaccines. And so we become cannibalist. It's easy, because the killing the lesser brothers and sisters made it easy for them to go out and kill the others, to kill our children. God wants us to love one another. Even, even the situation in Israel, the uproar over there and the killing of one another. 
could all be changed with the humane gospel of Jesus Christ. It could literally cause Jews and Palestinians to love one another if they would keep the commandments of God. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you.